Hello, my name is Riva Gujon, and today I have with me Emily Hawthorne, and we're going to be discussing the 100th year anniversary of the Sykes-Picot Agreement and what that means for the future map of the Middle East. So Emily, 100 years ago, we had French and British architects drawing up a map of the Middle East. And of course, the implications of where they drew those lines has huge reverberations that we see till today. Uh, when we look at what it takes to actually draw a map, there are essentially three ingredients that you would consider, right? So one is the natural geographic barriers, two would be the demographics, three would be the economic viability of the state in question. All of that seems to have been thrown out the window in 1916. And we do see Sykes-Picot as, you know, cited as the reason for a number of the big conflicts that we see breaking out in the modern age. Would you agree with that analysis or do you think that there's something more to it? Certainly when uh, this French diplomat and this British diplomat who were at the head of the ongoing negotiations over many months to divide up post-World War I Ottoman spoils into British French, and to some degree Russian territory, mm -hmm. they did not look at the economic viability of the territories. They did not uh, really look at the ethnic and the sectarian realities of the ground that they were that they were really putting a grid on top of. Um, however, they were doing it with an eye to British and French needs with that territory moving forward. Um, they were looking at a post-World War I victory. In, in the event that the war was won, they wanted to be sure that they had a proper bulwark against um, potential Russian aggression, Russian claims for that territory. Uh, so in a sense, they were looking at economic viability, but really for um, sort of the ends of a colonial France and the ends of a colonial Britain, making sure that they had the Levant territories, what's now Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, making sure that they had it divided up so that they each got their proper share. What it did ignore, of course, that agreement is um, a lot of the ethnic minorities, a lot of the uh, geographical realities on the ground, um, resource maps. Uh, these are some of the reasons um, really ignoring some of those realities certainly has led to instability in those territories. And it's led to an ability for stronger states to really take advantage of some of that instability. And back then, of course, we saw the European powers really focusing on the historical capitals of the day, right? So Cairo, Baghdad, Damascus um, were in, you know, Istanbul and um, what became Ankara as the capital, um, were all key instruments to ensuring that you could contain future Turkish expansion as well as future Russian expansion. As a side note, the Russian angle is very interesting because just a year after Sykes-Picot was signed, that's when Russia very cleverly leaked the Sykes-Picot Agreement. And that essentially stoked the flames for insurrection and the nationalist movements that followed. Uh, the European response, of course, to as it was trying to pull out of these regions and reduce their burdens was to put their eggs in in the basket of secular strongmen. Those have now pretty much collapsed if we're looking at Libya, Iraq, Syria, um, even Yemen to an extent, which had its own historical evolution. And now we have a few standing monarchies that have had more endurance really compared to those secular strongmen. Um, so looking forward, as we look at the Middle East and we look at Russia's continued interference in the region um, and trying to negotiate more effectively with the West, with the powers that stand today, who are the ones that really stand out to you as the ones who are gonna be shaping the post sykes picot arrangement? Right, so in 2016, when we're looking at who is active in the Middle East, we have to look at the regional players, uh, primarily Turkey. Um, we have to look at Iran, Saudi Arabia. And then we of course have the EU, we have Russia, we have the United States, but they really are more active um, and they influence from the outside. Um, whereas those regional players, Turkey, Iran, Saudi Arabia, are the strongest powers that are um, able to influence some of the politics, some of the security arrangements, um, and are even active in debating some of the territorial claims within those slightly weaker states um, that are part of the territory that was drawn up um, in the Sykes-Picot Agreement 100 years ago. And so the United States, as the one who inherited the Sykes-Picot map, is now struggling really to deal with this array of conflicts in the region uh, and having to step back to a large extent, knowing that it can get wholly consumed by these conflicts and that it does need to rely on those key regional players to take up more of the slack and, and get more involved. So when we look, let's start with the Gulf. What do you see that dynamic playing out between Iran and Saudi Arabia in particular? 
Right. The U.S. relationship in the Gulf is very interesting because for years, um, really alongside the whole building up of Saudi Arabia as a state, um, which did not exist at all as we know it today in 2016, in 1916, the time of this agreement being signed. Ibn Saud, the founder of the country, was just getting started. At that time, the United States has been a partner of uh, Saudi Arabia throughout its developing into the state that we know it today. Um, and But Saudi Arabia really lacks something that Iran has, um, and that is the history of having that territory, the Persian Empire, for centuries. And there is something there to be said for the strength that Iran has in laying claim to that mountain territory for so very long. Both Iran and Saudi Arabia are very active in influencing countries in the Middle East, um, and there is a rivalry there. Um, it's it's economic. Uh, there is a religious aspect to it as well. Um, Sunni and Shia uh, mm-hmm. sectarianism um, is at play in that uh, competition. But also right now, watching sort of the U.S. interplay between both Iran and Saudi Arabia and the U.S.'s decision to slowly warm up its relationship with Iran is causing interesting tension with Saudi Arabia and is making Saudi Arabia feel the need to develop its own alliances and its own relationships to bolster its strength in the region in a way that it never has before. So that's a lot of what we're seeing um, right now in the Middle East. You do need to look at Saudi Arabia and Iran's role um, in countries like Iraq and Lebanon um, and Syria, of Mm -hmm. course. And so Saudi Arabia as a nation is very new to this game. Right. Um, It is actually trying to apply military force to where these conflicts are. It's spending money, trying to be more judicious in how it spends. Definitely. But it also faces some pretty big economic vulnerabilities down the line. Yes. So Saudi Arabia right now, um, within this period of low oil prices, which is affecting any oil producer around the world, but with Saudi Arabia's reliance on hydrocarbon revenues, um, it needs to be absolutely sure that the money that it is spending um, in developing proxies throughout the Middle East um, and the money that it is spending um, internally is is absolutely the best spent. And as Iran comes back online with its oil exports um, post-sanctions, post the signing of the JCPOA, um, this is a dynamic, uh, the competition dynamic between the two is, is going to continue to play out. So Saudi Arabia is one big a new feature in the post sykes pico uh, arrangement. Uh, but we're also going back to pre um, sykes pico when we look at the Turkish-Iranian rivalry, right. which is coming back into play. I mean, this mm-hmm. is a rivalry that goes back centuries. Mm-hmm. And Turkey, who has very deep economic, military, and political power in this region, um, it's being pulled into its former Ottoman do- domains, especially northern Syria, right. northern Iraq. Um, and you know the threat of Kurdish separatism mm-hmm. is is pulling it in that direction. So you have Turkey that, on the one hand, is fulfilling this um, sort of Ottoman viewpoint of its region, where it does feel that it has the Islamic credentials to get more involved beyond its borders. But it's also existing in a a you know nationalist you know the identity of the Turkish Republic, right. where that um, acceptance of separatism when it comes to the Kurds especially is still a red line. And so you still see this sort of identity crisis that Turkey is trying to sort out within itself in a post sykes pico world. Right. So you are seeing uh, territorial claims um, from these powers that we're discussing, Iran, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. Um, It's it's less overt than it could be in a a directly post-colonial world um, right after the signing of the Sykes-Picot, um, right after World War I. Mm-hmm. We're in a different time period now where um, they're not redrawing the map. However, that influence and in making sure that their footprint is felt and that their footprint is very real in these countries that they lay claim to through uh, sectarian or ethnic or um, economic relationships, they want to be sure that that they are a primary force active. Um, and, and the Levant really is the main playing field where we're going to see those three be interacting. And the way they do that is through their economic linkages, but as well as a security footprint. And there, we are definitely seeing, you know, signs of, you know, for example, Turkish forces getting more involved beyond its borders. And that is certainly not a trend that goes away in the post sykes pico world. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Emily, for the conversation today. Thank you all for joining us.